have 60 people now where you could get a 20% across the board efficiency improvement by solving that one problem. The person who can go into an organization, identify the organizational and relational problems that exist, and then help groups solve that, will be leaning heavily on what we call soft skills. Packed into that is a bias that the hard skills are more practical, more useful, and more valuable, and that the soft skills are not. Are people often telling you to learn engineering or design so you can be a better leader in game dev? Do you know what skills to develop when you are a leader? Have you struggled to lead people who do work you don't understand? From the outside, game dev is often described as designers and artists and engineers working together to make something amazing. And that's true, but even in the education available, our industry focuses most of its time on the hard skills of game dev, like painting or scripting or coding, and a little on how to lead well, build effective relationships, and influence organizations for the better. Meanwhile, so many teams report that the reason they fail was because of poor leadership and management. They had the raw talent, they had the skill sets they needed, but it didn't matter because ineffective people with authority were an obstacle instead of an assist. We wanna talk about this today and discuss how you can get past this misconception to maximize your chance of building better games. You're listening to Building Better Games, where we show industry leaders a better way to make games that players love. Your hosts are Benjamin Carsage and Aaron Smith. We've spent over a decade shipping some of the biggest games in the world. We've also helped game studios around the world improve their approach to building great games. Our mission is simple, help you ship better games with less work and fight back against the dysfunctional systems that frustrate studios around the world. What's tough about this conversation is it touches on like 12 different topics that we've covered in various capacities. It touches on incentives, touches on leadership versus management, touches on holistic leadership, touches on man people management, touches on everything. But when you know, we, I think that really what this comes down to is we keep making the same damn mistake over and over again and how we're assessing what reality is. And I know that sounds abstract, but I want to be really clear what I mean. We think we still act like we're working in factories. We are not working in factories. And by the way, like, I don't mean to like be melodramatic here, but I would say that from my perspective, it is safe to say that the majority of what we're doing in our industry is not working. Like our success rate is not good. Like the vast majority of studios fail. The vast majority of projects fail. The vast majority of features don't ship or they ship with really bad quality. And I don't see that improving dramatically right now. In fact, what I see is the industry consolidating right now to squeeze every single dime it can out of those few parts of its portfolio that are performing. And that is a scary place to be. You know what I mean? It's and, a there's it's a total <clears throat> double down. Every it's just like double. Yeah. Well, okay, this didn't work, but maybe it's because we just need to go harder and if fewer that focus on this at yes. least uh, you know. And it's it's yeah it, yeah. We're going so the it's wrong like way. I don't I don't see a lot of evidence that like we're all really good at this. And and so I think that this is actually a great time for us to take a step back and ask like what are the sort of legacy things that we're doing that are not working anymore. Is this idea that if I bring together the best expert, the best craft expert in all the different disciplines, so the best engineers, the best designers, the best artists, the best narrative people, the best QA, and I put them all on a team together, they'll make the best game. And I just want to comment, this has been attempted so many times with such poor results over the course of, like, the, this doesn't work um, or if it does work, it usually works after an incredibly long period of time, incredibly painful, and often not actually profitable when it when it something finally ships. I would argue. But, but I would argue keep, that we it keep is, trying this strategy. Yeah, I would argue that that strategy is doomed to fail unless you have a, you're doing a bunch of other actually good things in addition to. Yes, it. exactly. And I think it, I would say the legacy idea is if I just bring the right massively talented sort of hard skill people together onto a team, they'll produce something amazing. And that's all I need to do, right? I just need to put them all in the room or whatever, and then I walk away and I'm expecting a good game in three years or something like that, right? And it's like this, that's not, that's not how games are made. Um, that's, not a, that's not a recipe for success. Um, and in fact, our modern world is, is showing that sometimes a few people fresh out of college 
or like just throwing together a small studio with no serious experience and no pedigree and no, none of the hard skills expertise that would make someone's CV look all shiny are putting together products that are sometimes just beating the pants like pound for pound off of what some of these huge studios that are trying the strategy are doing. And like, I think the fundamental argument we're making right now is that the stuff that we're focusing on is not the most impactful stuff. So it's like, I, I have triaged so many hundreds of different issues at various game studios now when it comes to when I, again, I'm going to use the word production. I don't, again, I do not mean the thing that producers do. I'm talking about like the fundamental systems and methods that are in place to take a game from idea to completion. All the problems that come up with that. Here's a problem I hear about all the time. Hey, team, there's team X, team Y, and team Z. And the managers of those three teams don't talk to each other and they're little fiefdoms. And sometimes we do redundant work and sometimes we send over uh, a half completed piece of work for them to finish the second half of, and then it sits there for two weeks. Or sometimes there's an argument about implementation that doesn't get resolved. And as a result, the thing sits on a shelf for a month before it goes into the patch. Like I hear this shit all the time. And like, if you understand anything about game development, you know that no amount of talent, like raw individual local talent solves that problem. That is a leadership and collaboration problem. And this is the point. Like the to once, once you get your eyes opened to the broader systemic problems that happen in game development, almost everything comes down to collaboration, leadership, and, and the systems by which human beings effectively move work amongst each other and, and, and come together to build a product. Right. Or just not being able to deal with the complexity of the system because we don't know how to talk to each other. Or we have created systems that force us to kind of go up and sideways in hierarchies to get the information we need to do our jobs. Because, and this comes back to another thing, you were talking about legacy issues, because fundamentally... We're not trusted to do our jobs. And I I see that like undergirding a lot of this as well. The reason we want, like why why does a lead, because so let's say you're an art lead and you came out of uh, character arts, right? You did 3D, you did texturing, that sort of thing, right? Okay, so now you're leading an art team and that art team has VFX artists and animators and whatever. Well, you don't know that much about animation or VFX. I mean, you know a little bit and you can kind of see it, what it looks like, but your background doesn't allow you to support that directly. So you go and you start going like, well, I need to basically become an associate capable person in these disciplines. And you start investing all your time trying to learn about animation and VFX and all this different stuff because that's what you think you need to do in order to lead them. And I'm going, no, you're a leader. Your job wasn't to be an expert in everything those you lead do. The only reason you need to do that is if you don't trust them to do a good job. And the, by the way, in those systems, there's a good reason you don't trust them because you're not giving them the information they need to do a good job. You're not teaching them how to collaborate and communicate well. You're not teaching them or, or pointing them towards the goal. And so you can't trust them. So you feel like you have to know what they're doing and you have to micromanage them. But all of it spirals because you've at some level decided that like, what matters most is not me actually stepping into a role of how do I help this whole group succeed towards the goal together? It's like some version of how do I make sure I know everything that's going on? And, and it, again, it drives trust down inside of the system so that they just, they just become, again, they're, they're like people who just, you know, screwing things onto widgets in a factory line. Yeah, exactly. And I think I love what you just said there, because I don't think that anyone in that system realizes how much cynicism is going to build up if you just go that direction too far. Um, and because the one of the secrets, the dirty secrets about game development is like, I was, I was talking to uh, my girlfriend about this the other day. I was like, I've always had a belief because, and this belief comes from 10 plus years of just working with team after team after team directly and like leading teams that it's unbelievable how much stress, how much difficulty, how much risk, uh, how much spinning people are comfortable doing if they feel like they're winning, if they feel like they're on the winning team. 
Like if your team is just like shipping awesome shit to players and it's just nailing it, like, and the players love it and they're like, ah, we love, like, we love this stuff. And the company's like, holy cow, how did you make this awesome stuff? If you're on that team, like that team can suck in like eight other ways. And like the juice that you get out of that feeling of being on that team is like a drug that cannot be rivaled by just about anything else. And so it's crazy to me that I hear all of these studios and teams talking about just like, well, no one knew what the vision was. No one knew what the goal was, or our leaders couldn't agree on the goal, or we had three teams all working on the same goal and then wondering why we ran out of money. And like, uh, like oh no, this, we we mm. never checked how the players were responding yeah. to the game. We just we just didn't worry about or, that. Or yeah, our target audience was everyone that has a mobile device. And I'm just like, it, you know, just like this kind of stuff. And it, it's it it robs the team of I think the opportunity of ever getting to that point where they feel like they're on the winning team. You know what I mean? And like, I, uh, I, I just can't stress enough, like how important of a function that is of leadership too. So it's like, we started talking about collaboration and I think you took us to like, I'm, I'm almost, there's some pillars here, I think, where there are misconceptions. There's like the collaboration, the importance of collaboration misconception. There's the one you just mentioned was like the importance of clear goals and like the specifically the leader's role in steering that like like the a world where all we focus on is getting all the stuff done and that like but everything in the goal department like everything in the like the what like what are we making department is all low efficacy we're just like literally blindfolded just shooting archery shooting arrows all around the room and it's like the and and hoping that eventually what we can do is fill the entire room with arrows and it's like <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, uh, you're going to be shooting a lot of arrows. You're the, you're going to be working overtime shooting arrows. You're going to run out of arrows long before you fill up the room. And if by some miracle, by some act of God, you actually get close to filling up the, the room, you might even realize that it wasn't even the right room to fill in the first place. So it's like that like everything is stacked against you. If, if all you're focused on is getting the work done. There's something else that came up for me too, which is like, you know, talking to so many producers, so many leaders, which is Ben and I sitting doing this coaching and like this is this acknowledgement of leaders being aware, like line leaders being aware of systemic risk and not being able to address it. Like the classic example of this is like, hey, there are these four teams that we have in Singapore for our big AAA studio, and these teams all do critical work. And there is an inefficiency that, by my estimate, creates about a 20% drag on all four of those teams. So let's assume that there's 60 people on all four of these teams, and they're all now 20% less efficient because of this systemic risk I've identified. Maybe it's like leaders don't collaborate effectively, or maybe it's communication challenges with time zones, or maybe it's like, you know, cost of delay by kicking work back and forth to the headquarters studio and, you know, nobody feeling like they have the political clout to deal with it or whatever, uh, or a VP that's like basically completely incommunicado. Uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff and but they're the only decision holder in this space so i hear this shit all the time and i'm like so you have 60 people now where you could get a 20 percent across the board efficiency improvement by solving that one problem and sometimes it literally is as simple as that one problem being like hey jim doesn't isn't available to make this decision so because one leader couldn't make one decision, we sustained this massive cost that could like the, like the collective cost of that could literally accumulate to be millions of dollars. And, and what's even worse is I talked to the line leaders involved in that and they're all acutely aware that that problem exists and exactly what it would be needed to solve it. When I ask them, why, the, why don't they solve it? They say things like, well, no one listens to me or I don't have the power to do that or I had a bad performance review last year. And if I bring this up, my boss might get mad at me or, um, they don't really care about what we think over here in Singapore or like insert really dumb reason why that problem can't get solved. And then you're going to tell me again that your problem, I, ju I just gave you an example of like the massive rot and cost 
that that inf- that is inflicted upon an organization by what is a small efficiency problem a scaled across a broad organization. And, and yet the th- only thing you can think about is like, well, we need to hire more engineers so we can get more work done. And I'm just like, I'm slamming my head against the desk because you have no idea how, or you're completely uninterested in solving that problem. So again, I get the message here to, to leaders is like, I, I call this sort of in the systemic risk bucket. One of the most effective things a leader can be doing is identifying that systemic risk and actually doing something about it. And, you know, and it's like, I, but I, I, I recognize that this is one of those elephants in the room as well. It's like, well, that's not in my job description or producers aren't allowed to do that here or no one cares what producers think on this or whatever it is. And I'm, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so busy. I, I can't, can't even possibly yeah. think about doing that. No. Right. Like I've got so much else on my plate or the last person that tried to go solve that problem did get fired. Right. I'm not going to go do that. Um, and I, and I think this is, and again, this is where we're focusing on the wrong thing. So we've, we've talked about um, a couple of, of legacy issues. Actually, I won't list them out. Um, but I, I had another one that's popped up here, which is, uh, you're in my favorite phrase, soft skills versus hard skills. Now, this is similar to one of the first one where I was kind of talking about like, well, you know, those hard skills that if you have the best experts, but there's also this idea that we have that the person who can go into an organization identify the organizational and relational problems that exist and then help groups solve that will be leaning heavily on what we call soft skills um, as they do that because they're going to have to be talking to people. They're going to have to be uh, cre- like solving other people's problems and connecting the right people and influencing things for the better. They're going to have to be leading in a cultural and product vision-related way that's going to help other people get to the goal. And they're gonna be spotting the things that are getting that way and removing them. But we have the, we have one, I don't know if there's like, I'm curious what you think. For me, I think that what underlies all that is people think soft skills are somehow easier and anybody can do them um, versus hard skills that require years of expertise. I know, I think that's at least some of it. I think there's other people that are just like, I have no idea what to do with soft skills. I don't know how to teach them. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it. And I, now I think you labeled a couple of the key biases there. Um, I, I feel like the root, the rotten, nasty, shitty root of that terrible misconception. That's not just in um, technology, by the way, or games. It's in corporate America in general, the corporate West, whatever you want to call it. Um is there there people don't realize this but we we have been trained in mass production and factory work like that that idea that like the more deep your technical skill set is like uh, and like let's be real here when we say hard skill we're talking about more valuable skill that's the other thing too that no one wants to admit we say hard and soft skills and when most people say that they they in p- packed into that is a bias that the hard skills are more practical, more useful, and more valuable, and that the soft skills are not. Now, and I and and when I hear people also who don't feel that way go publicly and say, "Hey, we need to focus more on soft skills," I'm like, "Stop calling them soft skills. Soft by its very nature, like would like what if we instead of soft skills we said flaccid skills? I mean, then it would really illustrate the point. You know what I mean? Like, can we not call them soft skills anymore? Can we just call them skills and bucket them in different types of skills? You know, like I, I'm, I'm so frustrated with that terrible ideology because again, it, it, what it does is it just keeps pushing us back to that factory work, like do more stuff, make more things, do more math, like, you know, make it practical. Like, and it's, it's, um, again, there's a whole separate conversation you and I have had in the background, which is like, we live in a technocracy right now. Um, which, you know, has created all kinds of benefits for society, but this is one of the bad things about it is because the, the, and why this matters now is because we live in a different world than we did 50 years ago. We cannot mass produce our way out of the problems that we have right now. That was not true in 1930 In 1930 inventing the car was, was like the quote unquote easy part. Getting a car into the hands of every single person was the hard part. Now it's where we flipped like the mass production is now the thing we can take for granted. Right. And the innovation is the thing that is hard. 
And so, and in this, in, in video games, we are at the bleeding cutting edge of this. So this is more true for us than it is for even enterprise technology, in my opinion, because you're adding narrative storytelling, you're adding visual, visual aesthetics that stimulate all the right emotions and well, and your your audience is in no way captive. They can go do a million other things that all are out there trying to occupy their attention. Like not just games, but movies. Yeah, exactly. TV, apps, social media, all of this is, is gr- vying for attention here. And you're trying to create something compelling and engaging. Um, when, and I think, so, so again, the two ideas, one is that the soft skills are easier and the other is that like, we don't really know what to do with them and we just hope people figure them out. We want to take a quick break from the podcast. There's no shortage of challenges in game development and leaders are often attempting to solve huge problems without the support, direction, or mentorship they need. It leads to stress, anxiety, and even feelings of isolation. We've been that leader feeling out in the limb with no help and we wish that on no one. Because of this, Aaron and I are offering focused short-term coaching for the challenges you are facing. We'll spend time with you every week to help you understand and overcome what's in your way. If you've got problems and want help from coaches who have spent real time leading game development, check out the show notes or head to buildingbettergames.gg and click coaching. Thanks. Let's get back into it. When I try to determine what's hard or easy in life, I you know where the first place I go is? What's everyone doing and what's nobody doing? That's an easy way. Like to, It's not the only thing that matters in the conversation, but it's a great way to start. You know what I mean? It's like, like we live in a world where a lot of people think it's super easy to be an entrepreneur. The only people that say it's hard to be an entrepreneur are the people that are actually entrepreneurs trying to be entrepreneurs, <laughs> right? So it's like, it's I'm that, that is just nonsense. And so that, so I think you've, you did a great job of invalidating that thesis that like hard, hard skill means more difficult. Um, but there's something else too. It's like, again, I, I think I, I have like, I, I have a, such a strong emotional reaction just around the the terminology. Um, because, because to me, I'm like, shouldn't hard or soft skills be related to the level of impact? Shouldn't that be what determines how hard or soft a skill is? So again, with the thing you're trying to tell me that it's propaganda, it's, it's Taylorist propaganda. You saying that like, you, like it's, Hey, it's, you know, what's really, really hard is me putting my fingers on the keyboard and making like characters pop up on the screen and then putting those out onto production. I personally am obsessed with engineers. I think the thing that they do is amazing. I don't know if it's something I could ever do well. I'm jealous of them. I'm in awe of them. Some of my favorite people in the world are engineers. I've they they are an inordinate high uh, inordinately high amount of my friend group. I love them. I adore them and all of their idiosyncrasies. They're my, some of my favorite people in the world. However, I just do not buy that, that I do not see a ton of evidence that just by nature of writing code, that they're just adding this like unbelievable amount of value to the overall output of a product strategy, just because they have this very deep and impressive technical skill. I think that there is a, just a huge gap there between the way the value people perceive that to be and what's reality. And I'm, and no doubt I'm going to piss off a lot of engineers when I say that, because you know, you, you all make a lot of money and you do really amazing things, you know, like, you know, you are all imminently employable in all for, for the rest of, uh, probably the time I'm alive. So congratulations. However, again, I'm taught, we're talking about how all the pieces come together to create value. Right. And it's, and it's like, I think that the best engineers I know, they get that. And they have the humility to understand that that's actually not the same thing as them writing code. And I think the same thing is true for artists in a different way, actually, in the games industry as well. Like I know so many artists who have sat in a corner making like really, really awesome shit that I could sit and like have them show me for like six hours straight and never get bored, but added no value to the product whatsoever. Like I have been in that situation. I have talked to studios who are in that situation. This is not, there. there's something off here, right? About the way we perceive this stuff. And that's kind of what we're trying to illustrate. Something just came up for me and it was the obsession with knowing that I think is part of this. Um, like, so, so I, as a producer, if I walk into the room and there's a conversation happening and it's between a couple of engineers or a couple of designers or whatever, and I can't follow that conversation because I'm not an expert in that. Do I feel uncomfortable? Do I feel like, oh man, I'm supposed to be the leader of this group. What do I do? I, again, if I'm that character art lead, 
And, and the animator starts talking to VFX about some timing stuff that I really haven't had to worry about in my career as a character artist. Do I go, I don't know if I can lead this group now. I, and again, I almost, put, and, and so I need to go figure that out so that I can know. And I go like, no, what you do. And the, the example I always give of this is when I was on a team that had like 14 disciplines on it. There's no way I could invest the time to hit even a basic level of capability in those 14 disciplines and do my job, right? Because they had every sub-discipline of art. There was engineering, design, QA. There was a publishing embed. There were two different production disciplines. There was narrative, copy editing. Like it was, there were, so, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just spend all day going and learning all these things so that I don't feel uncomfortable when somebody says a term? Or, and again, the alternative can I sit there and go, wow, and this is, a, this is what I did. I'm so glad there's all these smart people who are experts in this stuff, who know how to do this. You, you will be forced to do the most uncomfortable, most embarrassing thing that any leader can possibly imagine. You will have no choice but to ask a question. <laughs> And it may be a dumb question. Yeah, exactly. You know what? And then it, what is that old um, Mark Twain quote? Is it a Mark Twain quote where it's like better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt? <laughs> that's the, how we see that though, right? It's like, that's the most terrifying thing in the room, in, in our minds is to ask a dumb question in front of a bunch of experts. And, and even worse, if the sort of company culture is like, you should already know. The answer to that question, it again, it puts you up against that wall and uh, constantly where you, you, it's, it's, uh, a, I, I don't know if it's a catch 22 or what, but it's like, you, you have to know already. And if you don't, you can't ask because then people will think you don't know, and then you'll lose reputation. And I'm just like, that's insane. That's insane. And uh, that like, that is literally insane. Um, and, but I see that happen all the time at companies. Oh, it's, I mean, so many, and again, I, you know, you and I are both from the production side, but I've seen other leaders caught in that trap as well. And you can almost be like, Hey, if you can, it's, it's funny because it's a reframe on the whole situation. And it's a reframe based on the idea that collaboration is a good thing. And having different people good at different things is a positive. And it's okay that I can't micromanage what everybody's doing. It's like, I am. When I go into teams and I find out they're really good and I can't understand that their advanced conversation, it doesn't, at this point in my career, I'm not like threatened by that. I'm excited by that. It's it's a great thing. You want to know something funny? I'm sure you've experienced this before too, because um, you've worked in a, with a lot of different technical disciplines. And I don't just mean engineering, but like deep, like, like high skills cap required disciplines. Like that, the, the sort of like preliminary interviewing that I often do in those situations where I just create the list of dumb questions and then I sit down with the senior engineer or the senior artist or the senior tech artist or senior designer or whatever. And then they start drawing out all the components or just like kind of mapping out how things work and put right in the arrows between the boxes and the whiteboard or whatever. And then I start asking questions. And some of those questions were the questions that I brought in just to like educate myself for my own edification. But then I start like a, something magical happens about halfway through, which is I start asking questions based on what they've told me in that meeting. And you know what inevitably happens in every single one of those? My dumbass producer questions will almost always surface at least one nonsensical aspect of the way that the system is currently set up. And sometimes that will be something where the engineer goes, yeah, we've been toiling under this for years. We're all frustrated about it. And then I have something in my back pocket that I can start working on helping them out with. So that's a golden ticket right there. Or even better, the engineer sits there and I'm like, well, wait, you see, you just told me that that high risk tech or that high risk component of the system is actually critical every single time we patch. So we basically slam our head against that wall every single time we patch. Why, why are we doing that? And the engineer just stares at the, the whiteboard that he just drew. And then he looks back at me and then he looks at the whiteboard and he's like, you know what? I don't have a fucking clue. I don't know why. And it's just, and it's like, I, and it's not because that engineer is dumb. It's because like some, there is so much power to having somebody come in and ask the dumb questions because the, the a, a group of smart people rightfully assume that they've already asked 99% of the dumb questions. 
And so that one, but that 1% could be a massive risk for the system, right? So like there's, th this is valuable stuff too. I always love it when somebody comes in and does this. Well, see, and I, I want to call something out too, because if people are listening to this, here's a takeaway. If you're a leader out there and you end up leading a discipline that you don't have expertise in, you know, again, you're the art leader, you're the engineering leader, design leader, something, and now you've been put in a position of authority and suddenly there's these other disciplines. Don't go start taking classes. You have to read a book if you're interested in it or whatever. Like, again, you know, but what you should do is exactly what Aaron just said. Buy your you engineer's go, dinner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> have them like, sit, pull them into a, walk you through the system. Pull them into a room and be like, hey, I don't know a lot about this space. And now I'm I'm leading it. I trust you uh, to know all the stuff that, that I don't know about this. What do you think I should know? Right? What would help me help you and help us do a good job? What are the pain points you see? How does your work, like, what do you need to start work? What do you hand off and to who? How does that go? What are the terms? I heard someone say this term. Uh, they said they were talking about splining. The animator was talking about splining. Can you explain to me what splining is, right? Like, ask, ask that stuff. I have very rarely, because I've done that a lot, I have very rarely run into uh, a, a sort of a craft expert who was offended by the fact that I cared enough to just go in and ask. No, they usually love it. Actually, like there's nothing more that those people dream about having an, a producer or a leader that is engaged enough and gives a shit enough, or gives enough of a shit about them and their work to to engage. Like and and again, one of the things that that engagement brings is awareness over the most valuable problems to solve, right? Like, and again, the example that came up to me and like, I, I actually don't know what splining is, but like, let's say that this person explained that to you and was like, and it's also the hardest part of our pipeline right now. And, and you were like, well, why don't we fix that? Again, another dumb question, right? Within the context. And they're like, well, because it costs a lot of money to fix that. We have to buy this like super expensive tool to fix that. And you're you're aware from another meeting you were in because you're a leader that the company's about to sign a check for like 50 grand for this other thing that's not nearly as valuable as giving all of those people a 30% efficiency boost. And now you're right at the cross section, right in that position to basically be like, well, wait, maybe we should get this tool, right? And, the, and that, that, that poor contributor is thinking, well, I could never ask for that because we don't have that kind of money sitting around, but they don't have that broader context. So that's the power of what you can do by creating those connections. Yes. And by the way, that also speaks to, as you're doing this, as you're asking them questions as a leader, you are better able to do your job of force multiplying that group to be effective because you're learning about their reality. It, interestingly, you're not necessarily learning about their skill set. You're not figuring out how to do what they do, but you're learning about how what they do interacts with the system and that system as a leader is your responsibility. Um, there was one more legacy thing I wanted to hit on here. Um, and again, these are all related to that idea of like what really matters is having the best experts in the room or the, the like the craft expertise at the highest quality level or something like this. And this one is this, this problem we're describing, which actually isn't a problem. It's, it's not, this isn't a bug. It's a feature that your leaders should not be entirely focused on skills development for themselves or, uh, and like learning about everybody that they lead and everything like that. Uh, and when it comes to like, how do you do it? Um, this problem gets worse the higher you go in an organization. If you, as, as an organization scales, let's say you're an engineering leader and you're the engineering leader because like you were a really good senior engineer and then you became the principal engineer and then you became the architect uh, and now you were like the architect for the whole studio and now you're the CTO, right? If you still think your job is about writing epic amounts of code and Aaron and I have seen this in companies, that it's about like getting your hands dirty and getting in there and fixing everything. You are a bottleneck and a crutch to your organization in a way that is very bad for the long-term sustainability as that organization scales. The reality is that those engineers that I was talking about who were kind of like, ah, oh, man, I feel like my skills are degrading. And I was like, yeah, and you're increasing the effectiveness of every engineer in this organization by a massive percentage. And that's way more valuable than any code you would be writing. That that CTO who gets there and thinks that their job is just hard skills is so failing their organization, it's unreal. 
as you go up an organization, as you get into hundreds of people, and especially as you get to thousands of people, your frame needs to completely change to be about what's the culture I'm establishing inside of the engineering and technical parts of this organization? How do I want us to think about this? And that's not a question of can you write a bunch of really good code to build out some features? That's a question of what would it look like to set up a world where the leaders I'm leading are able to lead the leaders they're leading who lead the developers who do the work in such a way that all that comes together to create better games, better features, more engaging things for our players and audience to engage with. And so, yes, when, when, you, when you first become a technical lead on a team, right, or an art lead on a team, you're still probably doing a decent amount of the, the actual craft. But as you go further and further and further up the org, you're gonna do less and less and less of it. And that's a good, not a bad thing. But you need to completely reset the skills that you have. And you need to be willing to let go of that, like, well, I'm the best concept artist in the world or something like that. Yeah, that, that might be in your back pocket and you may do that on the side for fun. But now your job is about, I don't know, building style guides or managing people or, or talking to other stakeholders and other, other key leaders and other disciplines about how the art discipline is going to relate to everything else to, have to help all of this be a successful product. These are the reasons so many games fail is because as people go up this, they, re they maintain that obsession with the stuff, with the doing, and they don't go to that place where they're going like, wait a minute, what would it look for me to help everybody else work better? Um, they're just like, well, you know, the way I get us out of every problem is just working harder. And you know what? Doesn't scale infinitely. Um, it I just, mean, I, you're, I you're also think it's over. just, we're just, honestly, I, I, it was so funny. I had, as I was hearing you talk through that, I was thinking about like, how would I explain this to somebody in like a five minute presentation that sort of like kind of hits on all those key points. And one of the things I was thinking about is like back to the, what you and I talk about is like, there are sort of two major areas as a leader that you're thinking of when you think about forward momentum, you're thinking about impact and flow and impact is the, are the, is the vision. It's the goals. It's the what, and, and flow is the throughput of valuable things through the system. And so I think that what we're talking about, what we're touching on is this misconception that depth is the primary thing that gets in the way of flow. So like if you had an engineering, if you drew this out as a diagram on a whiteboard, if you had an engineering block, an art block, uh, a, you know, a VFX block, uh, an audio block, whatever, that like deepening, like basically stretching vertically the depth of each of those blocks into the rectangles that could be as long as possible would be the way to increase flow. But what we know is that that's actually not true, that it's the distance between those blocks. And actually, if you then put another box around all five of those blocks, that's the team, that the, it's also the distance between team A and team B, that's where all of your lossful problems come when it comes to flow. And so it, this is beyond just like, it's like people say, when I say, hey, you should trust your developers to do good work. And focus, like when we say focus on collaboration and focus on systemic risk and focus on goal setting and these things, we don't say that because it's like, well, because everyone feels better because this is a more modern way to lead. No, it's more prudent. All of your problems are going to be in the gaps between those things. Like uh, certainly not, sorry, not all. I want to be clear, nine out of 10. And so you're, you're optimizing for the one out of 10 case where the problem is technical capability. That's what we're trying to tell you. Stop doing that. Yeah. And I, it's funny because I was, you know, you think about this idea of like, well, why, why do you as a leader need to understand every discipline underneath? And sometimes it's because the system you sit within doesn't allow a developer to talk to a developer on another team or, in, or with, between disciplines. And so they come to you right? Because you're the lead artist, right? Or you're, you're the lead, you're the lead narrative, right? Okay. So they come, so someone comes to you and they're like, ah, something's not right. And you're like, I don't really know what you do. Oh no. What am I going to do? Well, I guess I've got to port this information over to the person you're having a problem with. So I'm going to go talk to their lead. And then their lead is going to talk to that person. And then that person's going to respond and talk back to their lead. And then they're going to come talk to me. And then I'm going to, you know, you're going to be playing this telephone game. And how many times, Aaron, I know you did this a lot. And I know I did this a lot when we were on teams with people and they would come to us <laughs> and I, they'd be like, well, this is the problem. And I would sit there and I would listen and I would ask some questions and I'd be like, you know what? I honestly don't know 
I really don't, I'm having trouble understanding what you're talking about because I don't know this space. But you know what? It sounds like this is an issue between you on team A, on our team, and this person on team B. Can you go talk to them about it? And they're like, I was like, have you done that? No, I hadn't done that. I, I was just going to tell you about it and maybe the tech lead. And it's like, sounds like if you or I to tried them, and they won't listen. Okay, cool. Different kind of problem, but also one that's just as important to address, right? Right. And and by the way, I'm comfortable not knowing so much because I trust you to your point because that is actually the prudent, wise thing to do in a collaborative system that's trying to create creative value. Um, I trust you not just to identify that problem, but also to go and talk to somebody in a completely different part of the company to see if you can solve it. Now, if you go, like you said, if you go and you talk to them and they like hard block you, now bringing me another lead in, somebody else, let's go help you get this through. Let's understand what their objection is. Let's let's like, you know, try to place the problem where we can all look at it and be like, what's wrong? How do we all fix this together? Ex exactly. But then my job isn't to know the, to have expertise in what you're doing. It is to create the relationships and influence that situation so that we get where we need to go as a team. And, and again, in systems where that's not normal, where it is like you have this sort of vertical motion before horizontal motion, before downward vertical motion that has to happen in order for people, in order for problems to get resolved. Well, yeah, now I get it. Now I get why you feel like you need to know everything. You need to be able to micromanage everybody because you're the one who has to ferry this information around because you can't trust your team to do it. Um, and I, and again, I would say, yes, you can, but you're, you know, if you're, if you're in a hard non-trust environment, it's going to take time, uh, to build up even individuals on your own team's willingness to try that stuff. But I can tell you, like, that's where the winning is. Like, it's so much better when I get to put two people in a room who do have all the expertise and knowledge that they need and weren't talking to each other and then be like, cool, it seems like you guys are working that this out. Let me know if you need anything. And I walk out and get out of their hair. I don't need to sit there and take notes or explain anything about what's, well, this is the big, no, I trust that they know what we're trying to do because that was, that is actually my job. That's what I've been focused on for this whole time. Now it's about letting them work through details and then they're going to come back and they're going to tell me what they need. And again, all of this involves there being this mutual trust, them to me and me to them. But if you, and it, sorry, not, but, and if you don't have that, um, everything is going to be so much slower to everything you were just saying. I loved it. I loved your thing with like the blocks and like the further away they are and how do you get them together? And so much, so much of my job as a producer and broadly as a leader was just about like trying to shove those blocks together so that they'd actually talk and work through the problems because they are higher level often than any individual expertise. They are about how are we coming together to do something amazing. Okay. So we want to do a quick hit on some of the legacy misconceptions we covered in this that we see all across game dev, and we think that they're slowing everybody down. Um, and so we we want to we want to get you away from these and towards something better. First, that idea that if I have the people with the best craft skills, I will necessarily make the best product. That that's the best way to get there. Um, just get all those. Your, your best, most qualified, most expensive experts together, put them in a room, and eventually a great product will come out the other side. This is a misconception. Second, technical depth is better than collaboration. It is better to have more expert people with deep craft skill than to have a group of people who are able to collaborate well together. See this all the time. Um, and this, this actually leads to like known toxic archetypes in teams of people who are just like, well, I'm really good at my job, so I don't need to be nice to people or collaborate well or talk to anybody. Third, the best leaders have the most technical knowledge. Um, the idea that in order to be a good leader, you have to know a lot of things. You have to be able to micromanage everybody. You have to be able to understand what everybody's doing all the time. Very related to this, is the idea that leaders can't lead without technical knowledge, that it's not possible for you to lead well um, unless if you understand all of what everybody you're leading does. Um, this breaks apart so hard in game dev, it's unreal, but this is still a, a misconception that is common. Fourth, we'll talk about the 
soft skills versus hard skills bits. Want one idea that soft skills are somehow easier than hard skills. I disagree with this. This is incorrect. <laughs> um, both, they're all, they should all just be skills and they're all skills that your studio needs. Um, and so you need to invest in them and have people investing in them if you wanna maximally succeed. Don't see some as the easy ones that anybody can just drop into and do effectively or you're gonna be in for a bad time. Another one related to the soft skills and hard skills. Soft skills are less valuable than hard skills. Um, maybe it's just that actually, no, what's most important is, again, we have that technical expertise, but actually, again, you need all of this and they all bring their value. Um, if your leaders aren't force multiplying, odds are they're force dividing, and that's going to be a problem for you. And then fifth broad thing, the more senior I am in an org, as I go basically up the chain towards the C level, uh, the more craft expertise I have. While there, there's truth to this, when I think about sort of an associate mid to senior path, as you start going into lead, uh, director, VP, and C-level roles, the opposite is true. The further away you get, the more you're thinking about culture, the more you're thinking about how do I help other people be effective regardless of what their skill sets are, how do I lead well becomes a much bigger question than am I really, really good at my the craft I entered this industry doing? And when we're talking so, about there you go. when we're talking about scaled impact, and so the question comes up, it's like, okay, well, okay, you told me all these things that are wrong, you told me what not to do. What do I do? What do I focus on? The three things we covered are setting clear goals and making sure your team is focused on clear goals, building structures and systems for collaboration, making your teams more collaborative. And then the third thing is identifying and removing systemic risk. Those three things are gonna get you way more mileage than obsessing about taking uh, an engineering class or doing art on your spare time. It's not that those things aren't cool or fun. Do them for fun. Do them because they're cool. Don't try to do them to be a better leader. Those three things we mentioned will serve you and your teams far better. Awesome. And I'm going to close with, with two ideas, two words that came up, and they've come up with us a lot in the past. Um, one is humility. Be willing to not know and be willing to ask the dumb questions. And the second thing is be willing to trust the experts that are around you and see if you can build their trust in you. If you are in a trustful system instead of a trustless system, you're way more likely to succeed. Did you enjoy this content? Every two weeks, we will deliver one actionable step that will increase your chances of delivering a successful game straight to your inbox. Join game developers around the world and sign up for the Building Better Games newsletter at www.buildingbettergames.gg newsletter. Again, that's www.buildingbettergames.gg newsletter. Thanks for listening. Over the last few years, producers have been asking Aaron and I, what's my role? What are the skills I should develop? How do I advance in my career? Game production is in a rough state. We've launched a course to help. It's called Succeeding in Game Production, What You Aren't Taught. Early feedback from our beta tester and early access audience has been overwhelmingly positive. So we're looking to help even more producers. If that's of interest, check it out in the show notes or head to buildingbettergames.gg and click course. Thanks, appreciate you listening.